Good morning, everyone. I'm James. And I'm Brett. And we are going to fill you in on some of the events happening at FBC. First, today is the last day to return your shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. So make sure to bring them back if you haven't already so that the gifts can reach the children in time for Christmas. Also happening today is our annual clothing drive at 1 p.m. in the Rec Building. We want to say a special thanks to everyone involved in making this event happen. And to those who were able to make any kind of donation, thank you. Next, we will be having an international mission study tomorrow, November 15th, in the Fellowship Hall at 5.30 p.m. The topic of the study is Prague. The different costs for the event can be located on your worship guide or on our website at fbcbolivar.org. Families are welcome. Also, we are still needing volunteers for bell ringing. If you are interested in this and would like to volunteer, visit bolivarcomorg slash bell ringing. The link to sign up will also be on our website, fbcbolivar.org. Starting next week is Share Your Christmas. This annual event is an awesome opportunity to bless a child in our local community with something special for Christmas. There will soon be Christmas tree posters in the lobbies with gift requests on them that you can pick up. The requests might be added to the posters throughout the next several weeks, so make sure to check them frequently. Yes, and once you have the gift, make sure to wrap it and bring it back with the original request so we know what it is. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. For more information about these or other upcoming events going on at FBC, please visit our website, fbcbolivar.org, or check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Have a wonderful day in worship. Have a great day. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We are so glad you're here. Um, we want to welcome those who are watching online or listening on the radio as well. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us, we'd invite you to text the word guest to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322. Also, after the services in both of our lobbies, we'll have someone at the Info Hub table who would love to meet you. We have a special gift for you. Let's begin this morning with a reading from Colossians chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 12 through 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's stand this morning as we sing hymn 338, Wonderful Words of Life.
Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church family. You guys good? That's right. We know two weeks ago we kicked off uh, 28 days of prayer, and we had this booklet uh, that we handed out. It's still available. If you haven't had a chance to pick yours up, uh, please do so. You can get it at the tables as you exit today. But today we're on uh, day 14. So we are completing today uh, our week of praying for revival as a church. We began praying for revival for ourselves. And next week we'll pray for revival for our community. But today we conclude our time praying for revival for, for us as a church. So would you bow your head today? Uh, hear these words from Colossians chapter 3 as a, as a, as a um, kind of a backdrop. And then we'll pray together today. Colossians 3 verses 14 to 21. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within him, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Church, as we call out to the Lord today, can you call out to him to provide you strength? Can you pray that the Holy Spirit would strengthen you to live out the gospel mission that he has given us within the church and in our community? Can you pray to the Lord today for strength? Paul prays that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we may be rooted and grounded in love. Can you call out to the Lord today for him to root and ground your heart in the love of Christ? And that love will be lived out on how we treat each other with kindness and patience in peace. Can you call out to the Lord today? Can you call out to the Lord today that not only would he strengthen you to live out his mission, and that he would ground you in his love that's evident in how we treat each other. But can you call out to the Lord today that he would fill you with the fullness of God, that we could have a better understanding of the breadth and depth of God and his love. Can you call out to the Lord today?
Father, as a church, we call out to you together as a family of, of believers, a family of followers of you. God, give us strength. Give us strength to personally follow you each day. Give us strength as a body of believers to represent you well, to treat each other, Lord, with kindness and love and peace. God, give us a, a greater understanding of, of who you are, Lord. At the end of the day, God, let us be an avenue by which you receive glory. And God, in our communities, they see the church and they, they, it points back to you and who you are. God, help us as a local body of believers, Lord, to follow you well. God, we thank you, Lord, for all the many, many blessings that you provide us. God, let us live thankful lives, grateful lives, and faithful lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This morning we have the pleasure of having Dr. Mike Furman here with us as our guest speaker. And this next song he had requested us for us to sing as we prepare to hear the message today. Hymn number 340, Word of God Across the Ages. Our focus scripture this morning is from Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let's continue by standing together and singing hymn 432, Speak, O Lord.
Well, leave it to me. <clears throat> I dropped something that I was bringing for show and tell this morning. But I think everything's in reasonably good enough shape now. <laughs> good to see you this morning. Morning text has already been read. It's in Psalm 119, verse 105, and I'll be coming back to that in due course. For over 1,500 years, in other words, for just over three-fourths of the times since the days when Jesus walked this earth with us, Christians have not had a copy of the scriptures to call their own. Now think about that. Think about that. We've not had a Bible to tote to church. We've not had a Bible to put on our nightstand. We've not had a Bible to place upon our bookshelves. The printing press, remember, is not invented until 1436 or thereabouts. Before that time, and for about a century afterward, the Bible is hand copied. Can you imagine how long it would take to copy just the Gospel of Matthew, 28 chapters long, much less the entire New Testament and the Old Testament, which is about twice as long as the New Testament? Think how long that would take to print that out in block print or in cursive. What does that mean? Well, because it takes such an extraordinary expenditure of time to copy the Bible by hand, it means that Bibles are understandably rare. And given the laws of supply and demand that are at work in every economy and every nation, that means that not only are they rare, they're also quite expensive. So for the average person, <clears throat> for example, in the Middle Ages, even if they could read Latin, Greek, or Hebrew, the languages in which the scriptures were then found in the Western world, uh, they would probably not be able to afford a copy of the scriptures for themselves, even if they were literate. And in fact, it may have been the case that there were some entire churches in Europe when there were churches in every little hamlet and village that might have lacked a complete copy of the scriptures in those years. When they have a Bible or any part of it, it's written in Latin, not the language of the people. And so it is the case that not until the 1530s that the Bible translated directly from Hebrew and Greek for the Old Testament and New Testament respectively begins to appear in English. And even then, the average person can't afford it. It's unavailable to them. That doesn't really start to happen for the English reading public until 1560 with the translation of the Geneva Bible that the, the average or typical family could hope to have one Bible to share in their home. <clears throat> Do you remember your first Bible? Do you own the Bible? Many of us would confess that the first Bible that we owned was really not a, a book or a library of books that we could hold in our hands at all. We first came to own the Bible as children in bits and pieces. You learned precious and prized snatches of Scripture. We are helpers. We are friends. God is love. God created the heavens and the earth. Love one another. You thrill to hear your Sunday school teacher or perhaps your parents or grandparents tell stories from the Old Testament and the New. Noah and the ark. Abraham and Sarah. Joseph and his brothers. And that wonderful story of God's providence found in those closing, what, 13 or 14 chapters of Genesis. David and Goliath, or in the New Testament, all those stories from the Gospels about Jesus, Jesus and Nicodemus, Jesus and the woman at the well, Jesus healing the woman with a bent back, 
Jesus and the call of the 12 by the Sea of Galilee, the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, how our hearts raced, and I suspect they still do when we hear those stories or read them. And back along life's trail, I, I came across a verse that was taught to me in either Sunday school or vacation Bible school, I honestly can't remember now, that is a text for the day's sermon. And it is in Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. <clears throat> of course, for many of us, our first Bibles consisted in the lives of our parents as we saw them live out the way of Christ before us as small children. It is not by accident on the dedication page of my PhD dissertation that I typed these words to Brenda, whose love supported me in the task, and to my parents, whose lives pinned the first gospel that I knew. I distinctly remember the first Bible that I owned. My mom and dad bought it for me when mom was out doing her weekly grocery shopping on Friday afternoon. I was in the first or second grade. I remember it was getting dark early and it was a cloudy day and I, I think it was this time of year or maybe on beyond Christmas. But as mom put away groceries from the sacks and started supper, she presented the Bible to me and while she worked in the kitchen, she helped me find John 3.16 and worked with me to commit it to memory. Do you own the Bible? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. After my conversion experience just shy of my eighth birthday, I had a, a few years of what I guess I'd call arrested Christian development. I still read the Bible. I still respected the Bible. But I'm not sure what understanding was there. The Sunday school quarterlies in those days had a, a Bible reading listed for each day of the week, for each quarter. And you could check it off when you'd read it. I became a box checker. Whether I understood what I was reading or not, I became a box checker. Um, uh, knowing that a teacher would probably inspect the boxes on Sunday. But the fact is, I stumbled over many of the Bible's words. Say Mephibosheth three times real fast. <laughs> or Jehoshaphat three times really fast. Or any one of two dozen other words I could find in the Old Testament. Um, or some of those $5 words, those theological terms that Paul throws around in the New Testament. Or if I could affect my best television preacher accent, the doctrine of glorification. <laughs> Come on, you watch those channels too. <laughs> All that changed for me in June of 1966. I was a month shy of my birthday, which falls on July the 4th. Um, I was at that awkward age when I wasn't quite old enough to go out into public work, but I was no longer a kid. Every six weeks when Dad cut the alfalfa, I'd be out there putting hay in the barn. Um, I started doing custom work for a neighbor who was raking, cutting, bale, uh, raking and baling hay the, the following summer uh, as a kind of a permanent part-time job that year. But... In 1966, I was at that awkward age where I was a tweener, <laughs> and so, so I, I would uh, do some of the chores around the place, but, such, but I still had time on my hands to read or to play some ball or just get bored. I've always tended to be an early riser, and, and for some reason that June when I rose early, I found myself in the family room, and, and I took the Bible that mom and dad had there, and I began reading it. And for the first time in my life, I couldn't put it down. I started in Genesis and read Genesis and Exodus 
and got into Leviticus with all those rules for the priest. And uh, quite honestly, I bogged down there. But I didn't give up. I went over to the New Testament and found the sledding easier. So I started Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I read about Jesus, and I got hooked. And Mom and Dad's Bible, it had an, an abridged Bible dictionary. I'd never seen anything like that before. And I dug into it and read it. I found maps of Palestine and full-color pictures of locations in Israel that were of importance biblically. And, and out of that experience, something uh, uh, funny and unexpected happened. Uh, prior to that point, I'd had no desire to be a preacher. But out of that experience, I began to feel a call to preach, in part. And I discovered what I read later that Martin Luther said that God's word has hands and feet. It lays hold of a man. It, it, it follows after man and lays hold of him. And that became true in my own experience. I can see that my call to ministry then as I have every day since is essentially a call to preach and teach the Bible. Do you own the Bible? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I regret that a long time ago I uh, lost track of the Bible from which I preached my first sermon. In the summer of 1969, I bought this King James Version of the Bible and when I worked at Patterson's department store in my hometown of Moberly. Uh, I was making all of $1.30 an hour, the minimum wage in those days. Uh, and with it, given the fact that the price of gas was 30 cents a gallon, I could buy four gallons of gas with one hour of labor. Uh, as I recall, this Bible cost 16 or $17. Uh, I, this is the box that actually came in, and yes, I'm a pack, rabbit, uh, a pack rat, uh, uh, but it doesn't have the price on it, but I think that's about what it cost. And I bought it because I thought it would be a suitable Bible from which to preach, and I used it up until my marriage in 1978. I did more growing in Christ and changing in the years that I used this Bible than with any other Bible that I've ever owned. The, Christi the Christianity with which I grew up was sincere and loving, but it was also tainted with legalism. The rural congregation that my family transferred the membership to about the time I bought this Bible uh, uh, taught that Christ rather frowned on rock and pop music but he loved country music <laughs> I'm not making this up <laughs> I'm not making this up <laughs> so the late Hank Williams crooning your cheating heart and Johnny Cash singing ring of fire were good but the Beatles singing, Let It Be, or the Rolling Stones blaring out, Paint It Black, or the Turtles singing, Happy Together, they were bad, very bad. My parents read the Bible themselves to teach that no child of theirs should ever attend a dance, and that God preferred Baptist young men to wear crew cuts, prevailing hairstyles, be scorned. Uh, in fact, I never attended a dance, at least as a participant. About 15 years ago, when Jennifer, our youngest daughter, was a senior in high school, Brenda and I signed up to be some of the chaperones at the high school prom. <laughs> um, some of you don't feel real good about that, do you? I can tell. There's kind of a nervous <laughs> laughter. Well, it's the truth, so I'll own up to it. When I first bought this King James Version of the Bible in 1969, I pretty much understood the, the Bible to be a book of thou shalt nots, and I tended to read it legalistically. During the nine years that I used it, I came to see that when the Bible says thou shalt or thou shalt not, it's only saying, do yourself no harm, do yourself no harm. And I came to understand 
that what the owner's manual is to the safe and happy operation of your family automobile, the Bible is to living a meaningful life that counts. Do you own the Bible? During those years, I struggled to grow in my understandings of the scriptures. For example, during some of those years, I thought that the Bible conflicted with science. I later came to see the truth of what Frederick Buechner uh, was driving at when he compared the supposed truth, uh, the, the supposed conflict between the Bible and science to that between the podiatrist and the poet. The podiatrist says, Susie, you have fallen arches. <laughs> but Susie's lover says, she walks in beauty like the night. And each is speaking the truth, you understand? They're just speaking of the truth from different points of reference. What is at issue is the kind of truth you're after. In those years with this battered Bible, which I gave so much hard use, I decided that I could believe both my Bible and my science book. My, my years in college here at Southwest and later at seminary in Louisville gave me more of the Bible for which I will be eternally grateful. I will go to my grave appreciative of how my professors, Slade and Yarbrough, New Testament history here, and Jerry Horner in New Testament history, uh, some of my favorite biblical professors at the seminary, Clyde Francisco in Old Testament, uh, Peter Ray Jones and Harold Songer and John Paul Hill and George Bleasy Murray in New Testament. They gave me more of the Bible. They opened the Bible up to me and they, and they did this, which I think was even more important. They tried to open Mike Furman up to the Bible. They shared into the insights into the scriptures into which I'd never dreamed before. They informed me of the historical, cultural, and the social background of the Bible that shed so much light upon its meaning. They helped me to appreciate how God used real flesh and blood, sinful people like you and me to record his word and then to transmit it across 2,000 years of Christian history. They taught me the story of the English Bible, the greatest literary masterpiece of the English language. Eat your heart out, Bill Shakespeare. I was astonished when I first discovered that Jesus did not speak King James English. You know, we make sale jokes about that now. But such was my limited upbringing that it never occurred to me that Jesus didn't speak like we did. <laughs> and that he spoke Elizabethan English. Uh, I marveled when I first heard that the King James Version of the Bible was not widely accepted when it was first uh, put on sale uh, in 1611. It was translated 1607 to 1611, put on sale, uh, but people weren't buying it. In fact, it was slow to gain acceptance. It didn't gain widespread acceptance for 50 years or so. In fact, we're coming up on Thanksgiving, right? The Pilgrim Fathers that came to New England shores in 1620 did not like the King James Version of the Bible. They preferred the Geneva Bible of 1560, and they avoided this newfangled translation. You know, this modern translation, we got to watch it. Uh, and the King James translators, of course, were all members of the Church of England. Um, <clears throat> uh, Episcopalian, we call them on this side of the pond. Um, they translated the King James Version of the Bible at almost the same time that the Church of England and the authorities had the pastor, the first Baptist church on English soil, in fact, the first Baptist church in the world, in jail where he died under mysterious circumstances for the high crime of being a Baptist. During those years, I came to realize that God's word is to us is always infallible, but that human interpretations of it never are. What the Bible actually says and what I think it sometimes says can often be two quite different things. We too often approach reading the Bible, don't we, with a, or at least I'll speak autobiographically, with too much of an arrogant attitude of, here, I already know what the Bible says. I just want to see how this verse says it. And I doubt that I'm the only one that's been guilty of that. We all read the Bible through glasses that are tended by our culture and our geography, our race, our nationality, 
uh, our traditions. Uh, and, and so it's a constant challenge to pray that God's Spirit will help us put those glasses aside to hear what His Spirit is saying to us afresh. I'd gone off to seminary, met my wife there, in fact, the night before we were married, after our rehearsal supper. Brenda gave me this Bible that she'd ordered from the Baptist bookstore, now Lifeway Christian Publishers, now only online, <laughs> from her hometown in Chattanooga. It's the Bible from which I've read most often in these last 43 years. Do you own the Bible? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The story of the Bible is every man's and every woman's story. I, I have come to see, however, that the greater question is not, do you own the Bible, but rather, does the Bible own you? That's the stumper. I used to think that I read the Bible, but I've come to realize, and, and, and it's hard for me to put this exactly in words like I would like, but in some ways, the Bible reads me. I mean, some parts of the Bible, I'll just be plain spoken. Some parts of the Bible, in some days, I don't really like. That thing about turning the other cheek, and I want to say, Lord, I don't think you grew up in the same neighborhood that I did. Forgive your brother or sister, even when they may say some things about you that aren't even true. That's tough. That stuff about God not liking prejudice or pride or 10 other of our favorite sins. A lot of days I can wish that maybe the Bible hadn't said that or hadn't been so in your face about it when it did. It's what I've discovered is it's more comfortable for me to own the Bible than it is for me to allow the Bible to own me. I'm still discovering the Bible at 69 years of age. And I still struggle to allow it and its Savior and its values to own me. Frequently, I discovered that the Bible shows not how far I've come, but how far I have yet to go. And the story of my progress of faith, such as it sometimes has been, is a story of taking one step forward and sometimes then taking two steps back. So I ask myself and I ask you, does the Bible own me? Does the Bible own you? The gospel is this morning that the Bible is not uh, a fetish or an object of worship, scripturally understood. The Bible that would seek to own us is not an end, but a means. The Bible is a means of making a journey of faith toward God. By the power of the Spirit, the Bible moves us toward an intimate faith relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And you don't know how hard I work to, enter, to get all three members of the Trinity in that one sentence. The, folks, it's like this. The book of God helps us to focus upon the God of the book. <clears throat> the Bible's value is not as an object of worship itself, but rather in the fact that when it owns us, <clears throat> it points us toward Jesus. Phillips Brooks, the man who wrote the words to a little town of Bethlehem, which I suspect we'll be singing sometime in the next several weeks, 19th century New England preacher said over a century ago, the Bible is like a telescope. If you look through the telescope, you will see the worlds beyond. But if you only look at the telescope, that's all you're going to see. If we look through the Bible and this message of Christ, we will see the heavenly realm. But if we only look at the Bible and sing about it every now and then, all we're going to see is the dead letter. You can be sure the Bible will point you to Jesus. You will see through it to Christ. Jennifer's ears may be burning this morning, but I'm going to tell another Jennifer story. She was three or four years old, um, not reading, not going to school yet. We lived in Kansas City where I was a pastor at the time. 
one Sunday morning, Brenda and I had gotten her dressed and gotten the other kids dressed, and we were finishing up our own getting ready for church and uh, in the last stages, and we had the bedroom door open. Brenda, uh, Jennifer walks in with this little pink New Testament that the church had, had given the, the preschool girls and a blue one for the preschool boys. Um, and, and in that, in, in that um, um, Jennifer is saying at the top of her voice, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And Brenda and I found some amusement about it. We chuckled. And she wasn't really reading. But it hit me later when I reflected upon that. Has, any Bible, has anybody ever read the Bible more clearly than she was that morning? I don't think so. The Bible points us to Jesus. 30 years ago this fall, Kansas City civic leaders and people from the, across the Missouri Baptist family and f colleagues and friends gathered at the Warner Road Baptist Church in Kansas City to mourn the death of Hugh Womble. Womble had come to Kansas City in 1958 as one of the four original faculty members of Midwestern Seminary. In the 38 odd years since that time, this native son of Grady County, Georgia, had endeared himself to the Kansas City community and the Missouri Baptist family. He possessed a photographic memory. He was a Baptist church historian of national renown. Uh, he uh, had served as president of the Missouri Baptist Convention in the, the mid-1970s when the state convention was going through some rough sledding and needed a steady hand at the helm. He acquired a national reputation as an advocate for religious liberty and First Amendment rights and for the separation of church and state. He was a deeply patriotic man. He had served in the United States Marine Corps in World War II. In fact, after the Marines had secured the island of Iwo Jima in March of 1945, after almost two months of bitter fighting, it was Hugh Womble as a young Marine radio man who radioed that news out to the waiting world. In it all, denominational statesman and scholar and son of liberty that he was, Dr. Womble remained a man of sincere and winsome piety. The memorial service that afternoon was a, a wonderfully prepared and executed service, uh, beautiful planning. The dignitaries and others involved all fulfilled their roles well. But the most moving part of the service for me came in a quite unexpected place. It did not come in the profundity of any remarks made by Womble's pastor, nor in the loving eulogy spoken by his longtime friend and faculty colleague, Morris Ashcraft. It came rather in a song. The family had selected two songs, two hymns, for the congregation to sing at Womble's funeral. One was that, that, old, uh, that old hymn, The Master Hath Come, a hymn that has such smashing lyrics, as our British cousins would say, set to a, an old Welsh folk tune called Ash Grove. And, and the second one was, believe it or not, Jesus loves me, all four verses of Jesus loves me. And the only place in the service where the tear came to my eye was at that poignant moment when we sang Jesus Loves Me as a concluding hymn before the benediction was pronounced, when we reverently sang those words, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. And it hit me. Here's a man whom we would call a giant in Israel a brilliant scholar, <clears throat> a committed patriot, an eloquent spokesman for religious liberty whose life could be summed up in a hymn that he learned as a child 65 years ago in a Sunday school in South Georgia. And every time I think of Womble's story, I, face, I say to myself, now there was a man who was owned by his Bible. The Bible can change your life. Do you own it? And more importantly, have you given it a chance to a faith relationship with Jesus Christ to own you? Let us pray before we sing.
God of all scripture. We thank you this morning for the, those who have gone before us at great cost to themselves to record the words of scripture and then to copy it and transmit it down through the ages so that at last it comes to us. We thank you for the message of Christ that we find in the scriptures. And now we pray, Lord, that you would help us as we consider our response to Christ in conversion or in some further walk of discipleship or by coming to this church for church membership from another congregation or to renew our vows spoken long ago to you to walk more closely after Christ. Help us as we ponder the decision that we might make to you this day. In the strong name of Christ our Lord, amen. Let's stand together as we sing hymn 344, Ancient Words. Just a few things before we go. First, if you have any questions and would like to talk to a pastor, maybe to know more about following Jesus or being baptized or becoming part of this church or finding a small group, we would love for you to text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322. Also, there are many ways to give. Um, there are buckets at the doors as you exit the worship center. There are, you can also give by text or through the mail or bring it to the church office 
whatever works best for you. This time we're going to close by singing the first verse of Revive Us Again as our benediction, and immediately following, Tom Sneed is here to lead us in our vote. Let's sing together. We pray. Oh, good morning. Like Brett said, I'm Tom Sneed, and I am your vice moderator here at First Baptist Church. This is my final duty uh, as your vice moderator. Uh, 